Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for such a day like this when you want to reveal yourself to us. And we're asking, Lord, that the revelation of yourself will make us go in the new direction you want us to go in Jesus' name. As we have the mind, the purpose, to make us do your will so that the purpose of our creation and redemption will be fulfilled. We pray our hearts will follow along in Jesus' name. Whatever we have on our hearts, we pray, Lord, you give us the grace to set that aside so that your own word and revelation will do good in our lives in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding that we might behold wondrous things out of your word. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're reading from Esther chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 7. Esther chapter 2, verse 7. And he brought up Adassa, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. And as you look at verse 11, it says, St. Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what shall become of her. Verse 20, Esther had not yet showed her kindred unto her people as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. There are people that have questions on Esther coming to get married to Ahasuerus. But this is not the session to unravel and to show why this happened and that happened. Sufficient to say that Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, reveals very clearly and pointedly Look at that. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. What he has chosen not to reveal to the average person. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us. The things that are plainly reaching the record that is very clear belongs to us at our children forever that we may do all the words of this law as you come to Esther and you pick up the story from the area you understand that Esther was taken care of and brought up by Mordecai and that eventually we'll see the providence of God and what God did. And this part that you understand, you want to ask yourself, why am I here on earth? What am I appointed to do on earth? What are the things that will help me 
to be the man, the woman, God has created me to be, and the Lord has redeemed me. As his own will is revealed in my life. As we look at Esther, she obtained favor from the king because she had obtained favor from God. Please understand, the favor of man cannot come eventually to put us on the map and put us the place we ought to be, we ought to occupy in history, in redemption. But she had obtained favor from God in New Testament language will say she was saved by grace and her name entered into the book of God. You find in the whole Bible, you have Ruth, a woman, Esther, a woman. And those two names are conspicuous in the scriptures. I pray that your name we enter and remain in the book of life in Jesus' name. Look at her life. There was no record of sin. That is categorical. And there was no record of dishonor. No record of blemish. No record of worldliness. No record of transgression. No record of pride. No record, of, no record of evil in her life. And we know that you cannot be like that without sin, without blemish, without evil, all through your life recorded, except grace comes in into one's life. Without true conversion and without genuine salvation, that will be literally impossible. Look at her life. Her life was characterized by teachableness. Somebody who is bendable, somebody you can direct, somebody you can correct, somebody you can command. She was teachable. Her life was characterized by righteousness in the little details of her life. And in the great exposure of her life, you see righteousness, you see humility. Even when she climbed to the post and position of a queen in the land, and her husband, the king, had jurisdiction over 127 provinces all over the world, humility characterized her. A person that rises up. And the record of that life shows teachableness, righteousness, humility. It's not a person will just pass by because she has a significant lesson to teach us. Her life was characterized by intercession, characterized by prayer and fasting. Characterized by self-sacrifice. If I perish, I perish. It's the same mind with Paul the Apostle. I have great concern, body, that the children of Israel should be saved. And even if I were to be cut off, a curse from the Lord, that I would willingly accept if the nation will be saved. That same mindset of self-sacrifice characterized this Esther and of course the courage that she had the self-control that she had the answered prayer that came and the divine wisdom that we see in her life the invincibility not invisible but invincible unconquerable and undisturbed, knowing that the wisdom God had given her will save her whole nation and preserve the nation so that the people of Israel, the Jews, will not be destroyed. For Jesus, our Savior, the Lord, 
was to come through them. And then she became the source of national joy. I'm praying for you that God will give you a place on the map, a place in the nation, a place in the church. And what God has created that you will be, you will be in Jesus' name. I'm talking to you today on the subject, every Esther needs a Mordecai. Every Esther needs a Mordecai. Yes, God has his plan. He has his will. From eternity known unto God are all his works from before the foundation of the earth. He knew you. He knew you'll be here today. Nothing happens to a redeemed soul by accident. You are not an accident. God knows about you. And God knows what he's going to take you through. And God knows the height you are going to get to. You will get there in Jesus' name. But as Esther, Esther needed a Mordecai. No father, no mother, no teacher, no helper, and yet, whatever you think you lack, you will get there. Every Esther needs a Mordecai. Three points. Number one, the gracious opportunity under a Mordecai mentor. Mordecai dash mentor. The gracious opportunity under a Mordecai mentor. Point number two. The grateful obedience to her Mordecai minister. Mordecai minister. She was a minister to her. And she rendered not a forced Obedience, compelled obedience, painful obedience, reluctant obedience. No, a grateful obedience to her Mordecai minister. Point number three, the gliding obligation. That is an obligation that is gliding away, sliding away from us, slipping away from us, the gliding obligation of meaningful membership. You're a member of the family, a member of the church of the living God. And there is an obligation that God has outlined before you that you ought to address yourself to and that Obligation, the slipping away, sliding away, gliding away from you. The gliding obligation of meaningful membership. We'll come to point number one. What's number one over there? God bless you real good. The gracious opportunity under a Mordecai mentor. Look at that chapter 2 again. Esther chapter 2. I read from verse 7. And he brought up Adasa, that is Esther. He brought up Adasa, that is Esther. Look at the latter part of verse 20. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Like as when she was brought up with him. Look at that. That Mordecai brought up Esther. And Mordecai took her for his own daughter. Every Esther needs a Mordecai for an opportunity to be brought up 
discipled and trained. As you think about the whole revelation of scripture, every orphan needs a guardian. Esther was an orphan, no father, no mother. And what would our life have become if there was no guardian like Mordecai? Every orphan needs a guardian. Look in your community, look around you, and look in the church. Do you see those young people? Do you ask them where they're coming from? Their names, their father, their mother? Are they going to school? Are they not going to school? Why are they like this? Why are they like that? If that's an orphan, every orphan needs a guardian. Every child needs a tutor. You find a child as when Esther was a child. Every child needs a tutor. There's so many children that need help. They need guardians and they need the way to go. Will somebody rise up there and be a tutor? Every teenager needs a teacher. As teenagers are growing up, sometimes the parents are not able to handle them. And if God has given you the training of a teacher and the wisdom of a teacher and the compassion of a teacher and you want to dedicate yourself to dispelling darkness and bringing light to the souls that need the light, every teenager needs a teacher. Every sinner needs a seeker. That's why Jesus Christ said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost, sinners around us. They do not know how to live their lives. They go here and they go there, they fall into pitfalls. But every sinner needs a seeker. Every saint needs a shepherd. People are born again. People are converted. Sometimes they are converted far away. Sometimes they are converted by the preaching of other people that you may not know. And then they come across you. And it is not an accident that God brings them close to you. Every saint needs a shepherd. Every member needs a minister. Every member in the church. I come to the church, but nobody even knows my name. I come to the church, nobody ever accosted me to say, welcome. They give us a general welcome, but nobody touches my life, and nobody knows me. Every member needs a minister. Every minister needs a mentor. Those who are preaching, they should not think, I have the outline, I have the Bible, I have the concordance, I have every other thing. You need a mentor. Somebody to look at your life and say, do it this way and do it this way. And when you've done it that way, to come back and to say, I did that. And I had the measure of success. And then he teaches you and trains you again. Every Joshua needs a Moses. Because of what God has ordained that Joshua will become, every Joshua needs a Moses. Every Elisha needs an Elijah. Yes, the man was committed. Yes, the man was consecrated. Yes, the man was dreaming of a day when we will have the abundance of the Spirit of God upon his life. But then what could he have done? What could he have been if he didn't stay until that last day when Elijah said, Now ask me what you want. And he said, I need a double portion of thy spirit. Every Elisha needs an Elijah. Every Apollos needs an Aquila with Priscilla. That you take him up. Yes, he knew something already. He was even trained under a person no less than John the Baptist. But when they listened to him, they said, this one will need our help. He will need our training. He will need our touch. Every Apollos needs an Aquila or Priscilla. Every Mark 
needs a Peter. And every believer needs the Bible. And as we look at the whole Bible, and we see all these people, and we come back to ourselves, you need a Mordecai mentor. And I pray that your Mordecai mentor will not run far away from you in Jesus' name. And your ministers will not look at what you don't have. They will look at what you have that is to be developed. You will come to reign on the throne. Some people don't believe that. I said you will come to reign on the throne in Jesus' name. God will make it happen. What I have not told you is... Every Timothy needs a Paul. Every Timothy needs a Paul. The same way it runs from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. As one man could have become greater than he was, but he didn't understand. Every Lord needs an Abraham, but Lord allowed himself to be separated from that Abraham. He never became what he could have become. He lost his uh, cattle. He lost those who married his, uh, some of his daughters. He lost even the wife and even lost the dignity of being a father. He missed his chance. I'm looking at somebody there you will not miss your chance. Uh, let, let, let's look at this Timothy. Every Timothy needs a Paul. We're looking at Second, Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Look at verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. You see that? Timothy had been brought up by her own mother and grandmother. And the mother and the grandmother had taught him the word of God. Actually, he had become born again, converted, before he ever met Paul. Look at chapter 3, verse 15. Chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 15. And that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What your mother, your grandmother taught you, the scriptures brought you to salvation. And so you understand, Timothy wasn't converted through the ministry of Paul. And yet he said, my dearly beloved son, First, uh, look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 1. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. He was already a follower of Jesus Christ, a certain disciple. The son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. Already a believer, already a child of God. And Paul had not met him, even at that stage. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him this convert, him, this believer, him, this well-reported child of God, him will Paul have to go forth with him. And he took him and circumcised him 
because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that he was a Greek. You see that he spiritually adopted him as a child in the faith. Others had labored and they had shown him the way of the Lord. But whenever Paul referred to Timothy, he wasn't saying, uh, you know, fellow believer and all that. He called him his son, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. Timothy did not say, no, I'm not your son. Don't claim me as your son. I knew the Lord before I met you. I was born again before I met you. I was a disciple before I met you. I was useful and profitable before I met you. And you had a good report of me. No, he accepted. He's my mentor. He's my minister. He's my teacher. He's my pastor. He calls me his son. I'm glad to be the son in the faith of the apostle Paul. Look at chapter 3 verse 10. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. It's one thing to know. It's another thing to fully know. Fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, love, patience, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, like he's going to deliver you. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers, corrupt men and seducers, sinful men and seducers, hardened men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at this, verse 14, but continue, but continue. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul the apostle was the teacher, the minister, the shepherd, the pastor, the mentor of Timothy. And what would Timothy have become? without the encouragement and without the upliftment of this young person. He was able to achieve and to be who he ought to be because of the mentoring and the teaching and the training and the upliftment coming from mentor Paul. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. What he said was, he was going to send Timothy to Philippi. He wanted to have a true report, a good report, and 
on a breached report and he knew somebody who will be faithful transparent who will go there and bring back a report that is not modified a report that is not edited a report that will be true to the situation in philippi verse 20 for i have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your stage for all seek their own other people seek their own profit their own advantage not the things which are jesus christ but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father he has served with me in the gospel as a son with the father he has served with me and he keeps on serving in the gospel trustworthy first corinthians chapter 4 in first corinthians chapter 4 here we're reading from verse 16 first corinthians 4 verse 16 wherefore i beseech you be followers of me telling all the corinthians be followers of me and do you think that's impossible let me show you an example verse 17 for this cause have i said unto you timotheus who is my beloved son faithful in the lord who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which is in christ as i teach everywhere in every church he knows what i teach everywhere in every church how did he know that he was with paul everywhere in every church and paul could have the confidence to send him out to go and represent him i pray you'll be such a son a daughter in the faith in jesus name first corinthians chapter 16 we're reading from verse 10 chapter 16 verse 10 now if timotheus come see that he, he may be with you without fear listen to this for he walketh the work of the lord as i also do it's not different you won't see any difference between uh, timothy and paul because he accepted training he received training and the training turned his life around for the better. The teaching will receive, the training will receive, will turn our lives around for the better in Jesus' name. Esther recognized a gracious opportunity, not by merit. There wasn't anything she gave to Mordecai. For Mordecai to pour is very live into the training of Esther. And there is nothing that can give to a real God Saint Mordecai mentor. It's just a privilege, an opportunity that none of us should miss. You will not miss your chance. Point number two the grateful obedience to her Mordecai minister. The grateful obedience to her Mordecai minister. We're coming to Esther chapter 2. Verse 20. Esther had not showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, charged her, commanded her, as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did 
the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. You can see the obedience of Esther. It wasn't a grudging obedience. Uh huh. He's told me to do that again. He doesn't understand. I'm no more a teenager. He doesn't understand. I've come to be of marriageable age. He doesn't understand. I'm already married to the emperor, to the king. He doesn't understand. I'm already a queen. And he's still telling me, don't say this. Don't go there. Don't touch that. Don't wear that. Mordecai. I've come of age now. No, not at all. It wasn't a grudging obedience. It wasn't a compelled obedience. That's okay because of his stature. I don't know what he will do. He might do this to me. Not something like that. It wasn't an eye service obedience. There are people that will give eye service obedience, not Esther. It wasn't a temporary obedience as it was before she left home, before she got married. So it is now, even at this time, it wasn't selective obedience. Okay, you can talk, but I'll sit. I'll choose the one I will do. I'll choose the others I will not do. I'm coming to be a person of my own mind. I hear you, but don't think I'm going to carry out everything. I select. It wasn't selective obedience. It wasn't deceptive obedience. There are people that deceive in their obedience. Actually, they're looking for something. And they're very careful how they act, how they behave, until they get what they're looking for. And all the obedience they manifest at such a time is deceptive. It's to push the man forward and to think, I'm a good guy, I'm a good boy, I'm a good girl. And then they have what they want. After that, they will abscond. It wasn't... A self-centered obedience, only thinking about themselves, about themselves, my gain, my profit, my allowance, what I'm going to get. And because of that, the obedience, she was grateful and graceful in her obedience. The obedience of Esther was heartfelt and heartwarming. You'll be glad you are a teacher to such a person. You'll be glad you are a mentor to such a person. Her obedience was pleasant and pleasing. Her attitude, her disposition, her courage, her conduct, in her obedience, everything was pleasant and pleasing. Her obedience was thoughtful and thankful. Look at this Mordecai. I can't see any other son of his own with him. Of his daughter, of not having a daughter, I can't see any show of that. The man sells himself out. And the man spends himself without counting the cost. And without being sorrowful, I don't have a son of my own. I don't have a daughter of my own. And because Esther was thoughtful, she was thankful. She said, a man like this, I ought to obey. She had a pure and purifying obedience. You understand? Esther was very fair and beautiful. Esther was good to look at. And the king even saw the beauty of Esther. But she never posed a temptation to Mordecai. Mordecai 
never saw anything of her that will make her to be praying, oh God, save me from this temptation. Don't let me become a victim to this immoral life because of beautiful Esther. Her obedience did not make her to expose herself to Mordecai. She had a pure and purifying obedience. Look at Esther again. She had a constant and complete obedience. A constant and complete obedience. A person that is never tired of obedience. And she took obedience as a lifetime career. If I don't do any other thing, this is the thing to do. Such people must get to the throne. And as you make your obedience to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus is our King. And you make your obedience like that, heartfelt and heartwarming, pleasant and pleasing, thoughtful and thankful, pure and purifying, constant and complete, He will pull you up to the throne in Jesus' name. Amen. Obedience was prompt and proper prompt and proper and good enough Mordecai never asked her to do anything improper anything improper her obedience was without question prompt and proper prayerful and priceless obedience scriptural and sacrificial I pray the Lord will give me and give you Real obedience in Jesus' name. Oh, you say, you include yourself. Your father is dead. Your mother is dead. Your pastor, how you came to the Lord, he's gone. But who is your mentor now? Would you be surprised that not a month goes by I must read and learn from John Wesley. All his messages are recorded down. And the people that followed him until this week that ended yesterday, I still listen and I still heard and I'm still being trained, mentored by such people, the people that know the Lord. That's what keeps you fresh. That's why you remain constant and committed. God will not separate you from your mentor. Your mentor is still alive. God will not separate you from your Mordecai. Even if Mordecai does not get to the throne, you'll get to where Mordecai did not get to in Jesus' name. Look at this, Proverbs chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Our children will not depart from the way of righteousness. Uh, let's look at this. This is very important. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 7. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Your father is still alive. And your father happens to be a Christian, great opportunity. Hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Respect your mother, honor your father, honor your mother and have such respect for daddy and mommy that when they say, this is the way to go, you'll not say in your heart, old man, outdated woman don't act like that anymore our peers don't appreciate that our friends don't appreciate that you will not go astray in Jesus name verse 10 my son if sinners entice thee consent 
thou not. You respect your father more than those outside sinners roaming about in the community in Jesus' name. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lock privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit we shall find all precious substance and we shall feel our houses were spoiled cast in thy lord among us let us all have one pause my son walk not thou in the way with them refrain thy foot from their past, you will not join them. Amen. Chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. It says in chapter 3, let me start from verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction, for whom the Lord loveth. He corrected, even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. Uh, you know, the people, our friends, the friends of our children, of our sons and daughters, they make it look bad when a father corrects the son or the daughter. A mother corrects the son or the daughter. Your mother doesn't love you, does she? Your daddy doesn't love you, does he? Don't watch that. Don't go there. Don't mix with those people. Don't, don't, don't. He doesn't want you to see the flowery side of life. Does your daddy love you? Of course, look at verse 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. Here, ye children, the instruction of a father, be willing to be instructed. Ask daddy, ask mommy. What do you want me to do? I'm taking this decision. They want us to go on excursion, but really it's not compulsory. And this is what they will do there. Do you think it's best for me to go or not to go? And daddy says, what do you want to do? Daddy, you've been in this world before I came. You know the things that will help me and the things that might ruin my life. Tell me, and I will follow. I pray God will give you such a heart. Hear ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender, and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also be teachable. My father taught me also be teachable. My father in the Lord taught, taught me also be teachable. My mentor, my minister, my pastor, my shepherd taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live your will live. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 7. Proverbs 5, 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, don't postpone your hearing. Don't postpone your heeding. Don't postpone the obedience. Hear me now. Therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. 
what am I telling you? Verse 8, remove thy way far from her and come not near the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others and the years unto the cruel. Come back to Esther. If Esther had given a flower, had given herself to the street boy, to the one sleeping under the bridge, and to the one that is not under the control of his own father and mother, and then the goodness originating in her as a lady that had been given away now that it was time to get to the throne will she get to that throne tell me tell me you will not do anything today that will take the throne away from you tomorrow the lord will watch over you and the lord will not allow you in a moment of disturbance a moment of pressure while those uh, boys or those girls they want to impose themselves upon you and then when they ask and ask and ask and ask like delilah asked something eventually something was tired and said okay the information you have you want this is it and he lost his eyes you will not lo lose your sight you will not lose your revelation you will not lose your vision and what God has appointed for you to be in life I will still rejoice in my lifetime when I see you on top in Jesus name <laughs> chapter 6 I am reading from verse 20 Proverbs chapter 6 verse 20 my son keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother bind them continually upon thine heart tie them about thy neck when thou goest it shall lead thee when thou sleepest it shall keep thee and when thou awakest it shall talk with thee for the commandment is a lamb the commandment is a lamb and the law is light and the reproof of instruction and the way of life as you go to school son daughter you're discussing with other classmates schoolmates either while you happen to be going on the way together or you are coming out of school and you are talking and he is asking she is asking what are you going to do now as you go back home well mommy is waiting daddy is waiting i don't know what they have in mind when i get home i'll know all about that what do you mean i seen a secondary school and there's somebody that is telling you what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. Commandment, commandment, commandment. Me, I am free. What do you mean you are free? I may not even branch home now. I go to another place. I go wherever I want. And when I am hungry, if I don't have enough food in my friend's house, then I get back home. I may get back home 9, 9, 30, 10. What will your daddy say? nothing what will your mommy say nothing they just prepare the food and i eat they're even ha glad and happy that i came home i could have stayed outside you say what you're that free that is no freedom that is gradual suicide i will not be like that look at verse 23 the commandment is a lamb the world is dark. We cannot see our pathway. It is the commandment that sheds light on our pathway. And the law is light. And the reproof of instruction and the way and the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman. 
and from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman lost not after her beauty in thine heart neither let her take thee with her eyelids for by the means of a warish tempting tempting woman a man is brought to a lifeless piece of bread and the adulterer will hunt for the precious life nobody will hunt for your life if they hunt for your life, they will not catch you. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? So he that goes in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. Thank God I will remain innocent. I'm talking for myself, church. I will remain innocent. The blood of Jesus wash you whiter than snow in Jesus' name. Chapter 7, verse 24. Chapter 7, verse 24. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, don't turn your ears away, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she has cast down many wounded. There are some people that have been so proud, self-confident, me, I can go as far as I want. Whatever I see, whatever I feel, whatever I touch, I can restrain myself. I will go as far as I want. And these people who are so self-confident, they are the first people to fall. You will not fall. She has cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men see that. Many strong men have been slain by her. A house is the way to. A house is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers of death. I will not go there. I said I will not go there. You will not go there in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the gliding obligation of meaningful membership. Look at Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2. We're reading here from verse 21. Esther chapter 2. Reading from verse 21. In those days... While Mordecai was in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bixan and Theresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth, and they sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it to Esther, the queen and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when the inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before. The king. Here is something that God calls every saint of God, every minister of God, every member in the body of Christ to be vigilant. And this is an obligation. Here is Mordecai. He was sitting down at the gate and he heard two 
of the king's servants plotting and planning how they will jump on the king and how they will kill the king and they will destroy him. When Mordecai had that, he didn't say, it's none of my business. He has a security man. I'm not a security man. I just have my post at the gate here. Whatever they are planning, whatever they are plotting, I seal my mouth. It's not from me they will hear. And you know there are those who do evil. And when they do the evil, they look around, they say, you are the tailbearer, you are the carrier of news, you are the one, whatever you see, your mouth cannot keep quiet, uh-huh, you've seen this now, go and tell. You've seen this now, go and report. You've seen this now, go and expose it, and we will deal with you. You know those whistleblowers outside? They don't, people don't know them. If they knew them, they'll deal with them. And you want to be the whistleblower in the church? We will drive you away from the church. You will never see the daylight. Because of that now, the obligation that God has given to every member that you see evil, you will not allow evil to take root in the church. But everybody is keeping quiet. Even the preachers are keeping quiet. If they hear something is happening there, a bad egg that is going to corrupt and destroy all the other eggs, they don't have the courage and the heart and the mind again to speak against evil. I pray this obligation will come back. In your heart, in our hearts, if you see evil, you will not keep quiet. You will not keep quiet. You will not be on the side of evil doers in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 11. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which of the house of Chloe, that are contentions among you. They reported. And Paul, the apostle, didn't just say in a superficial way there is contention among you. He said, it was reported to me by the house and the family of Chloe that this is what is happening between you and within you and it is not good. He corrected it. And I pray you will make yourself a real bona fide child of God in the church in Jesus' name. Chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. People do not keep quiet. They said, this is bad. This is evil. This is rotten. And it was reported that there was fornication among them. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. That one should have his father's wife. They were speaking in tongues. They were going after the gifts of the Spirit. They were active in the exercise of spiritual gifts. But the obligation to report and the obligation to cleanse was slipping away from them. First Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear, I hear, I hear a member of the church has come to report to me. And I hear that there are divisions among you. 
and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approached may be made manifest among you. For then it's one thing for, to hear, it's another thing for the pastor, for the minister to have the courage to do something about it. If you are a pastor and you hear and the report comes to you that there is rottenness and infidelity and filthiness being practiced, God will give you the courage to cleanse the church. Courage. Somebody help me shout courage. courage. Our pastors will be courageous in Jesus' name. You will have courage. I will have courage. I will have courage. God will give you the courage in Jesus' name. What if somebody does not have the courage? The report is given. And then he's alerted about this happening, that's happening in your own local church. He doesn't have the courage. Look at this. For Samuel chapter 2, verse 22. For Samuel chapter 2, verse 22. Now Eli was very old. There's nothing wrong with being very old, but their courage had become old and stale. His backbone has become bent and steel. His eyes have become dim, almost blind. His heart has become insensitive. He cannot deal with evil anymore. Now Eli was very old and he heard, he heard, he heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. How? delay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Can you imagine how blind Eli had become? How weak Eli had become? They were not even doing it in secret now. They're doing it right in the, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. How? Maybe they came for, you know, preparation for the Sabbath day. To render their service for the Sabbath day. And right there, after practicing how they are going to render their service for the Sabbath day, right at the door, they were doing evil with the women. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear... I hear his voice is weak, no stamina, no courage, no fight within her, no fire against corruption. I hear of your evil dealings by all these people. Nay, my son. What did he say? Nay, they give excuses. That is not true. Nay, it's true. Daddy, they are telling lies on us. Nay, they are not telling lies on you. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. You are not only sinning, you are making the Lord's people to sin. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and there came a man of God unto Eli. And said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be the priest to offer upon my altar to burn incense and to wear an effort before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Verse 29. Wherefore, why? Kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, 
which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me. There are people, they honor those sinning members above God. They honor those wicked, backslidden, filthy, rotting members above God. We need them. If we drive everybody away, if we discipline everyone that commits fornication, everyone that commits adultery, everyone that steals, everyone that you know goes to the shrine, everyone that does this so that if we discipline anyone who will remain, that's because it's your son, that's because it's your daughter. And the Lord said, why do you honor them above me to make yourselves fat? With the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father shall walk before me forever. Tell me. But now the Lord said, what did he say? Be it far from me. There's no eternal security. Be it far from me. You will not keep on doing evil and remain on the work. Your life does not honor me. Your family does not honor me. Corruption has taken the better part of you. That be far from me. I pray God will not throw you away. Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 32. Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. There are people that have pleasure in those who do evil, those who commit sin. And those who are backsliders, those who are the rotting eggs, among the basket of good eggs, they know those people and they run under their shelter. They run under their umbrella. And if you want to say, hey, come on here, I heard you did this, I heard you did this, that's the way to hell. These people that are covering them with the umbrella of partiality. They will say, okay, let her go to hell, but leave her in the choir. Let her go to hell, but leave her among the ushers. Let him go to hell, but leave him in the work he's doing. No, don't touch him. Don't touch him. We enjoy their gifts. We appreciate their gifts. Whatever happens to them after, after a long time, when they go to the other side, that's between them and God, but leave them. And those people, they know it is wrong to do evil. They know the judgment of God, but they cover up and have pleasure in them that do evil. You will not be among the number. I will not be among the number. You will not cover up evil in Jesus' name. You love the people you expose. You love the people you report so that they will not perish and go to hell. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's sliding away from the church. That obligation is gliding away, slipping away from the church. That nobody is in the position to rebuke evildoers anymore. They don't have the backbone. They don't have the courage. They don't have the sincerity and the transparency. They don't have the love and the conviction for holiness to bring anybody back to the pathway of righteousness. You will not be like that. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 
We're reading from verse 22, 1 Timothy chapter 5, reading from verse 22. It says in verse 22, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. When you cover them up, you are partakers of their sins. When you gloss over their sins and you don't report, you are partakers of their sins. You encourage them. You tell them, even though I know, go ahead, do what you want to do, I will, you'll, they'll never hear it from my mouth. You are not fulfilling your obligation. Because it says, neither be partakers of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. You'll be pure. I will be pure. I will remain pure. Nothing will blot out your purity in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Esther. I'm reading from chapter 2, Esther. Chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the gates, in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bixan and Teresh, of those which catch the door, were, were rose and they sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai. The thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen. And Esther, normally, whatever she heard from Mordecai, immediately and promptly she will act on it. You'll be of that mind. You'll be of that heart that whatever you hear from your pastor here, your Mordecai, mentor, minister, shepherd, you'll act on it immediately in Jesus' name. The thing was not to Mordecai who told it unto Esther, the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name, in Mordecai's name, giving honor to whom honor belongs, giving due respect. This is not me. I didn't find this out. This is Mordecai that found it out. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. And it was written, it was written, it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. And it appears it died down. Everybody forgot. But it was on record. Your good works will be on record. Your good deeds will never be forgotten. And even though it appears it was forgotten, a problem came for Mordecai. He will not bend down to Haman. And because of that, Haman was angry, wrathful. He was furious. He said, I'll deal with him. And then he learned that he was a Jew. So he said, not only him, I'll deal with all the Jews. And Amon went for a banquet. And the banquet was good, was nice. But was coming back, he saw Mordecai again. That man standing the way he always stood. You will stand the way you have always stood. And he said, this is enough. I must deal with this Mordecai. And he told his wife and his friends, and his wife and friends said, very easy, make the gallows there 
and then hang him on the gallows. But I don't have any right to hang anybody by myself. Go and tell the king. Wake up early in the morning and go and tell the king and then get rid of him. Nobody will get rid of you. Everything the Lord has appointed for you to do in life, you will do in Jesus' name. In the church, whatever God has appointed, you will do. In the body of Christ, whatever God has appointed, you will do. And your good works will be on record in Jesus' name. Come now to chapter 6 of Esther, verse 1. Chapter 6 of Esther, verse 1. On that night could not the king sleep. And he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. And he found reaching that Mordecai had told of Big Sana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity has been done to Mordecai for this? Then the king's servant that ministered unto him said, There is nothing done for him, but you will not be forgotten. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the outer court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai. Impossible. Nobody will hang you. Nobody will kill you. You will not die before your time. Your good works will go before you in Jesus' name. He came to speak to the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, The king did not allow him to voice out the evil he wanted to do to Mordecai, the king of kings will not allow your enemies to talk. Yeah. Will seal up their mouth. Yeah. And the evil intention and plan they want to take permission for, it will not come through. Yeah. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart to whom will the king delight to do honor more than to myself. And Haman answered the king for the man whom the king delighted to honor. Let the royal apparel be brought which the king used to wear and the horse that the king rideth upon and the crown royal which is set upon his head and let the apparel and the horse be delivered to the hand of the one of one of the king's most noble princes that they may array the man with whom the king delighteth to honor and bring him on the horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him, Thou shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. The Lord will honor you. Yeah. Privately, publicly, yeah. in the city, yeah. in this country, the Lord delights to honor you, he will show you to the world. Verse 10, 
And the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so. Look at this. Do even so. Your enemies will bow before you. Do even so to Mordecai the Jew, which seated at the king's gate. Let nothing fail or fall that thou hast spoken. Then took him and him and the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai, and he brought him on horseback through the streets of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the Lord delighted to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but him and his church to his house mourning. He was sad, he was sorrowful, he has been conquered, he has been defeated, like your enemies are going to be defeated. Yeah. And having his head covered, and him and to cherish his wife and all his friends, everything that had befallen him, then said his wise men and Zeresh his wife unto him, If Mordecai be at the siege of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him. But shall surely fall before him. Shall surely fall before him. Shall surely fall before you. Mordecai had something good on record. The king looked at that record. That's how the promotion came unto Mordecai. You must have something good on God's record. You see evil going on, report it. You see backsliding going on, go to them, restore them. Help them to stop dishonoring the Lord and bring glory to God. It will come on record and on the day of your promotion, on the day of your coronation, of the day of your exaltation, all the good you have done will come out publicly for the rest of the world to see. I will see you when you are promoted. I will see you when you are honored. I will see you the day of your exaltation. So the seed now. Do the good now. Expose the evil now. And God is about to promote you. Rise up and tell the Lord. Rise up and tell the Lord. Every Esther needs a Mordecai. Every Elisha needs an Elijah. Every member needs a minister. You need me. You need the word I've spoken to you today. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And let God make you like Esther, like Mordecai, and the work of God, which God has given us as obligation, will prosper in all our hands. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord.